At first glance, the determinant is just another complicated formula to be memorized, but it's actually connected to a lot of intriguing and beautiful mathematics. In this video, I'll show you how thinking carefully about the concept of area leads naturally to the formula for the determinant. And to do that, we start our story in two-dimensional space. Picture two vectors v and w starting at the same point. If we slide a copy of w along v, and a copy of v along w, we get a parallelogram. Let's consider a function a that measures the area of this parallelogram. As we shift the vector tips around, the area changes as well. What rules should this area function obey? Well, for one, the area of the unit square should be equal to 1. The unit square is spanned by the basis vectors i hat and j hat, and sometimes we may write them as column vectors, or even join them into a matrix. Let's note this rule down. What other rules does area satisfy? Well, there's a rule that feels so trivial that we often ignore it. If you bring the two vectors together so that they lie on a straight line, then your parallelogram gets squished and ends up with zero area. But this turns out to be an important rule as well. Now, there are two big things we can do with vectors. We can stretch or squish them, and we can add them together. Say I stretch v by a factor of 3, then the area seems to triple as well. And this makes sense since we can split the original parallelogram into three small parallelograms, each formed by v and w. In symbols, it looks like we can pull the constant factor 3 out of the area function a. Similarly, if we squish v to become half its original length, then the area seems to halve as well. And this makes sense since two of the squished parallelograms can assemble to form the original parallelogram. Dividing both sides by 2, it looks like we're pulling the constant 1 half out of the area function a. In general, it looks like we can pull any non-negative constant c out of a, since scaling a vector by c should also scale the area by c. Finally, what happens to the area when we add two vectors together? Say the vector v plus u forms a parallelogram with w. How does this parallelogram relate to the parallelograms formed by v and w, or by u and w? I think you can see the answer if you just stare at both diagrams for a while. Just cut this triangle up here, then shift it down. Adding vectors, then forming their areas, gives the same result as adding the original areas together. I think that's pretty cool. However, this new rule isn't as innocent as it seems. Suppose we set u to be minus v in rule 4. Then, v plus u becomes v plus minus v, which becomes 0. And any parallelogram involving the 0 vector has 0 area. Rearranging this equation, we see that the area of the parallelogram formed by minus v and w is negative the area of the parallelogram formed by v and w. This looks bad since area is never negative, but it looks like we just pulled a minus 1 from the area function a. Here, you could give up and reject these rules as nonsense, but a lot of the most interesting mathematics comes from seeing where nonsense leads us, so let's keep going. For starters, this lets us remove the condition that c is non-negative from rule 3. Following these ideas further, things get weird. Imagine forming a parallelogram using the same vector v plus w twice, which has zero area by rule 2. Applying rule 4 in the first slot then lets us split this area term into two area terms. We can then apply rule 4 again, since there's still a v plus w in the second slot, and this gives us four area terms, but two of them are just lines which have zero area by rule 2. Since this whole thing is equal to zero, we come to the curious conclusion that swapping the two vectors v and w in the area function introduces a minus sign. It turns out that the sign tracks the orientation of our parallelogram, 
If going from V to W is a counterclockwise motion, then the area is positive. Otherwise, going from V to W is a clockwise motion, and the area is negative. It's quite interesting that simple properties of area imply that space has a very natural concept of orientation, or of left or right-handedness. It appears to be built in at a very fundamental level. So we know all these rules now, but so what? We still don't know how to actually calculate the area of a parallelogram. Or do we? Let's start by writing v and w in coordinates using the basis vectors i hat and j hat. By rule 4, we can split the first area term into a sum of two area terms. Then, we can apply rule 4 again to split those two area terms into four area terms. By rule 3, we can pull the constant terms out of these area functions. And by rule 2, the first and fourth terms vanish. Finally, we can change the aji term to minus aij using rule 5, and we know that a of i and j is the area of the unit square, which is just 1. And just like that, we've discovered the formula for the determinant of a 2x2 two two matrix. Going up a dimension, finding the volume of a parallel pipette seems to be a significantly harder task. But really, we've already done most of the work. The rules in 3D are very similar. For example, the volume of the unit cube, spanned by basis vectors i hat, j hat, and k hat, should be equal to 1. Similarly, if I squish two vectors onto the same line, then the volume becomes zero, since a flat rectangle has no volume. This holds for whichever two vectors you choose, so if any two slots of the volume function v have the same vector, then the volume must be zero. Much like before, if I scale w by a factor of three, then the parallel pipette volume gets tripled. The same thing happens if I scale the vector u or the vector v. We can replace this constant 3 with any constant c, positive or negative. Adding vectors works the same way as before, except now, instead of shifting a triangle, we shift a triangular prism, which is something like a thick triangle. And if we repeat the earlier argument involving two copies of the vector v plus w, applying rule 4 to split up the volume into four separate terms, and then using rule 2 to get rid of the first and fourth terms, we see that swapping any two slots of the volume function v introduces a minus sign. This time, the minus sign captures the orientation of 3D space. The parallel pipette formed by vectors v, w, and u in that order has positive orientation if and only if it satisfies the right-hand rule, as in this illustration. And now, we're ready to calculate the volume of a general parallel pipette. But first, I'll rewrite v, w, and u as v1, v2, and v3, since this will let us see the patterns more clearly later on. We can then expand the vectors in coordinates just as before, and then we can apply rule 4 to split the sum, which gives this intimidating chunk of formula. But undeterred, we can apply rule 3 to pull the constants out of the volume function v. We then see that most terms have some repeated vectors inside, so by rule 2, they must disappear. So it really isn't that bad. We're left with only 6 terms. The basis vectors in each term are all permutations of i hat, j hat, and k hat, so we can repeatedly apply rule 5, swapping two vectors at a time, to rearrange them into the i, j, k order.
Since each swap introduces a minus sign, the sign of the term depends on how many swaps it takes to rearrange the vectors into ijk order. In particular, whether the number of swaps was even or odd. Now, this is the usual formula for the tree by tree determinant, though I need to issue a strong warning here. Normally, matrix entries have subscripts corresponding to row, then column, but in this video, I'm emphasizing column vectors, so all of my matrix subscripts will be column, then row instead. This turns out to not really matter, but do be careful if you're comparing this to a textbook. Now, these terms look like a mess, but there are some patterns to be found. The first subscripts always run from 1 to 3 in order, whereas the second subscripts always form some rearrangement or permutation of 1 to 3. In fact, since there are 3 factorial or 6 permutations of 1 to 3, we see that these terms cover every single permutation. We'll come back to these ideas shortly. Going from 3D to n dimensions poses some challenges. We can't use i hat, j hat, and k hat anymore, and we don't have enough colors. We'll write the basis vectors of n dimensional space as e1 through en, where ei has a 1 in the ith row and zeros everywhere else. Using this new notation, the coordinate representation of a 3 dimensional vector now looks like this. Similarly, we have the representation of an n dimensional vector and we'll often use a summation sign to write it in a more compact form. Now, let's look more closely at the permutation idea from just now. Each time we swap two vectors, a minus sign pops out, and so the goal is to arrange the subscripts in the ijk or 1, 2, 3 order, since we know that the volume of the unit cube is 1. Put this way, the v function isn't really important. What matters is the underlying permutation and how many swaps it takes to rearrange it into 1, 2, 3. There's a cute way to find the number of swaps needed. Write your permutation on one line with 1, 2, 3 some lines down. Then join 1 to 1, 2 to 2, and 3 to 3. This is called a braid diagram. Imagine a horizontal line that sweeps down from the top. Each time it passes a crossing, it tells you what numbers to swap. So here 1 and 3 cross, and so we swap 1 and 3, then 2 and 3 cross, so we swap 2 and 3. Anyway, we see that what matters is whether the number of swaps is even or odd, and so we define the sign of a permutation to be the remainder modulo 2 of this number of swaps. As we've just seen, this is also the number of crossings in our braid diagram. In this example, the sign of 3, 1, 2 is 0, since we used an even number of swaps. Now, if you're thinking carefully, you might wonder why the sign is well defined. That is, what if I can find a way to change 3, 1, 2 into 1, 2, 3 using an odd number of swaps? Well, that's impossible, and to see why, we'll have to take a closer look at our braid diagrams. When drawing a braid diagram, there are three rules. First, you can't have two crossings at the same height since this confuses the horizontal line. You also can't have two lines touch and not cross, because we're only trying to count crossings rather than touching or intersection. Finally, you shouldn't pass three lines through the exact same point, since this really upsets our poor horizontal line. With these rules in place, we can examine why the sign is well defined. Imagine I have a braid diagram and take two non-crossing lines so that the left number is smaller than the right number. Then, any way you draw these lines, they always cross an even number of times, which doesn't affect the remainder mod 2 when counting crossings. Similarly, take two crossing lines so that the left number is greater than the right number. Any way you draw these lines, they always cross an odd number of times, so they always contribute 1 to the number of crossings modulo 2. This gives us yet another way to define the sign of a permutation. It is the number of pairs in your permutation where the left number is bigger than the right number. Let's look at an example of a braid diagram for a more complicated permutation. <laughs> 
It took 6 swaps to change this permutation into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so the sign is 6 mod 2 or 0. In terms of the n dimensional volume, this means that a minus sign was pulled out 6 times, so the volume is minus 1 to the power of 6, which is minus 1 to the power of 0, which is equal to 1. In general, the sign gives us a way to express the volume of an n-dimensional cube involving permutations of the basis vectors. We're almost ready to find the n-dimensional determinant. We just need to adapt our familiar rules to n-dimensional space. If any two slots of V have the same vector, the n-dimensional volume is zero. You can always pull out constants from any slot of V. Adding vectors together in one slot, with all other slots fixed, amounts to adding the corresponding n-dimensional volumes. And finally, swapping two slots amounts to introducing a minus sign, tracking the orientation of space. Now, we can do the same calculations as we did before, but in n-dimensions. We start off by expanding the vectors in coordinates, then we apply rule 4 to split the expression into a sum of many small terms. There are n to the power of n terms in this sum, which is a lot. For n equals 3, we saw earlier that there were already 27 terms in the sum. We then apply rule 3 to pull all of the constants out. And just like before, most terms in this big sum contain at least one repeated vector. So they vanish, leaving only the terms that have no repeated vectors. That is, terms involving permutations of the basis vectors E1 through En. But we know how to deal with such terms from our study of permutations just now. They reduce to determining the sign of permutations. And here is the formula for the determinant of an n by n matrix. Known as the Leibniz formula, it is a sum of n factorial many terms, often taken to be the definition of the determinant. Shout out to Leibniz. Let's look at how this formula works in practice. When n equals 4, there are 4 factorial or 24 terms in the sum. Each term corresponds to some permutation, which on a matrix looks like a choice of exactly one entry in each row and column. We can group these 24 terms into 4 groups of 6, depending on which entry you choose from the first column. Here are the 6 terms you get if you choose the third entry of the first column. Notice how the entry we chose from the first column blocks off the first column and third row. So, the six terms come from permuting the entries of the matrix that arises from deleting the first column and third row. Similarly, we can look at the other three groups of terms, depending on which entry of the first column we chose. That's it. The act of striking out a row and column messes with the sign of a permutation. So, as we go down the first column, we must include an alternating pattern of pluses and minuses as a correcting factor. This gives us the usual cofactor expansion along the first column. Yeah, that's all.